Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are going to have a really wonderful conversation with Dr. Shelley Praveen. She is the head of Division of Biochemistry at the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in Delhi. Thank you for being with us. Before we continue this conversation, let's take a quick look at a brief profile. Keep watching Eureka. To develop resistance for disease and to develop tolerance in crop plants against changing climatic patterns, biochemistry of plants needs to be understood. And it is where Dr. Shelley Praveen has significantly contributed. Dr. Shelley Praveen is currently heading the Biochemistry Division in Indian Agriculture Institute of India at New Delhi. She graduated from Delhi University with an honours degree in chemistry from the Hindu College from Delhi University and obtained her post-graduation and PhD from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. Later on, Dr. Shelley obtained his post-doctoral experience at University of Florida, USA and Scottish Crop Research Institute, UK. Dr. Shelley Praveen has done outstanding work in the field of biochemistry of stress responses to reduce the burden of disease in plants by developing transgenic tomato resistant to tomato leaf curl virus and working on heat stress in wheat crop. She also worked in the nutritional enhancement in pearl millet. Dr. Shelley received various national and international recognition. Noted among them are prestigious Waspik Award for Agriculture Science and Technology and ICAR Punjab Rao Deshmukh Outstanding Women Scientist Award in the year 2017. Thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity. You have a very nice uh, institute and a good laboratory which uh, we can visit and then learn quite a lot. So let me start with some uh, very inquisitive question. You were born, brought up in Delhi. All your studies you have done in Delhi. Perhaps the only agricultural land that you would have seen when you were a student is perhaps only photographs in uh, your uh, textbook or maybe, you know, some film clip in your television channel. How you chose agriculture? Because usually most people will think that I will become a doctor, I will become an engineer, I will become a finance person. Not many will look at agriculture as an option, right? Particularly from a big city like Delhi. How come you landed here? Very good question you asked. Uh, as you said that uh, I was born in Delhi, so right from my beginning, my schooling and my college days in Delhi University, I was interested in science. In science, both physics, chemistry, biology and mathematics. But in those three subjects, I was liking chemistry the most. Mm -hmm. So while graduating from Delhi University, I did it from Hindu college. When I went for an admission, I was open whether I will go for a physics honors or a chemistry honors. But once I saw the chemistry department there in, at Hindu College, uh, chemistry was my first love that time. Okay. So I opted for chemistry honors. And full three days, very vibrant time I spent in Hindu College. And during studying chemistry at that point of time, I found that there are three different forms, like okay. physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and organic chemistry. I was more interested in organic chemistry. So after completion, I thought it is good to pursue organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, when I was looking, there was another branch called biochemistry. So that time that subject was coming up and then I noticed that in Indian Agriculture Research Institute, they are giving degree, master's degree and the doctorate degree in biochemistry subject. Okay. Uh. That is how I opted for biochemistry. And once I came to this institute for an interview, that is really an interesting episode in my life. Mm -hmm. Nobody can imagine so many farmland at the heart of Delhi. You, you were surprised completely. That's right. As you said, I have seen fields only during when we were crossing through trains mm -hmm. or in the movies. So I was not having a first-hand experience to see fields, agricultural fields. But when I came to this division for an interview and I saw the fields, that time I decided biochemistry and that too in agriculture. So basically uh, two things captivated you, the uh, subject and also the land that was just outside your uh, building. That's right. That's a, that's a very interesting thing. See, one of the major area that you worked in uh, your initial part of your career, which also is uh, continuing today, 
is uh, stress management in uh, plants. That's right. We get stress. Uh, humans get stress in modern world, maybe because uh, we are running against time, maybe uh, because we are not very organized, maybe because there are uh, so many other issues, right? How do plants get stress? When you say stress management in plants, what kind of stress one is talking about? Yes. Uh, you can see that biochemistry is a uh, chemistry of life. Mm. So in any living organism, there are some chemical reactions going on based, um, based on the uh, appropriate environment. Whenever there is a change in environment or you are affected with certain pathogens, mm. your chemical reactions got changed. And that is what we call is stress. Okay. Uh. And there are several ways of stress management, even within us also. So in a plant, what kind of stress can occur? I mean, what all can uh, engender stress? Okay. Like in plants, if there are some diseases, okay. it's a viral attack or a fungal attack or a bacterial diseases. So whenever these pathogens come and invade plant cells, they want to use those cells for their purpose. Okay. So cell machinery is diverted. That time plants are under stress. Okay. So we have to develop certain strategies so that plant can cope up with that stress. So that is one area when plant gets stressed. Another is you can see the changing climatic conditions. Okay. So you, like uh, it's a temperature, temperature is one area, increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. So once plant is in the field, they have to experience they are not mobile. So they cannot take shelter as we do. So they have to uh, face those realities. So under those conditions, they are in abiotic stress. Okay. Sometimes there is a heat stress, sometimes there are water deficit, sometimes drought, sometimes excess of carbon dioxide. So all those are abiotic stresses. Plants are not stressed with all organisms. They are very happy with some organisms. That's right. Right? Yeah. So how is this uh, difference taking place? Important question. Very good question. For example, like uh, in us also, there are certain diseases and uh, like viral diseases and in human being also some people are more resistant to diseases and some are more prone to uh, infections. So that is basically your how good is your immune system. We always say if your immune system is good, you are not prone to diseases. So humans are lucky that they have a well-defined immune response. In plants there are not that defined immune response but they have very good defense pathways. So if the defense pathway is strong, plant is not able to get that infection. Mm. And there is a constant battle between the pathogen and the plant. So host pathogen interaction goes on. Whosoever is winning, if pathogen is able to invade the defense mechanism of the host, then there is an infection. If the plant is fighting back and the defense is strong, then the plant is resistant. Okay. One of the area that you have worked and uh, successfully come out with uh, solution is tomato. Uh, what is that disease? What did you do? Uh, you have seen certain tomato plants. If you have an exposure to tomato field, tomato leaf curl virus. So as the leaf the name, kind of curls. curling of leaf. It is a very common sim symptom and it is a worldwide disease. Anywhere the tomato is grown, tomato leaf curl virus. So when the is there. leaf kind of curls, it also means that it cannot do the adequate amount of photosynthesis, so which means that the plant is. Very true, very true. Uh, the main symptom is curling of leaf, the photosynthetic area is reduced and the photosynthetic efficiency is going down. And if the virus comes at the early stage of the plant, even plant is not able to grow. Okay. And there is 100% yield loss. Uh, so that is an important disease of tomato, very economically important disease and it is causing huge losses. And like uh, any other viri viral diseases, there is no viri site. Mm, you cannot have a... You cannot kill the, virus kill the virus. Because virus survives with the host. Very, very, very interesting point. In fact, uh, even in among human beings, we usually say, right, suppose if you have a cold caused by virus, uh, if you don't take medicine, it will take seven days. If you take medicine, it will take one week. There is no way you can actually uh, attack a virus with a drug as of now. Right? That's right. We will take a very short break. Keep watching, Mireka. We are going to discuss with her how she attacked this problem of tomato curl virus. Keep watching Rekha, we'll take a very short break. Today we'll take a closer look at the draft immigration bill 2019.
to look after your citizens for their welfare and make sure that they grasp the right opportunities i believe are crux to the issue therefore i think that this bill is well timed and are to my mind pretty well drafted be it a recruitment agency or a student enrollment agency they have to be registered under this act and more importantly they are also rated so they are rated in this particular act so this will provide a basis for anyone who is going abroad to look into what kind of facilitation or what kind of services he is taking from through technology we will register the migrants as well as the students and they are not supposed to come and queue in front of any government offices the idea is to keep it entirely seamless faceless hassle free process but how do we check illegal migration it is linked to terror it is linked to drugs it is linked to money laundering so control of illegal migration is extremely important awareness generation remains the prime factor a second if important thing is the law enforcement Welcome back to Eureka. We are having a very wonderful conversation with Dr. Shelly Praveen. She is the head of Division of Biochemistry at Indian Agricultural Research Institute in Delhi. Before the break, we were talking about uh, your interest. I mean, your your a, a study on uh, tomato leaf curl disease, which is caused by a virus. So this disease actually uh, uh, stuns the growth of uh, tomato, and then the yield almost becomes zero. How did you attack it? What did you do actually? when i started working on this disease uh, first of the uh, first of all i wanted to know how viruses are invading the host cell and how they are weakening the defense mechanism of the host yeah. so we started with that and since virus are, uh, viral genomes are very small and they code for very low amount of protein we wanted to know how important these protein which can weaken the defense so we started working on different viral proteins and while doing so we found that one of the viral protein which is going and surround, going around the nucleus in the plant cell okay uh -huh. and so it is basically like covering the plant cells nucleus that's right the, the protein released by the virus is covering the nucleus like a enclosure yes that's right so by confocal microscopy we studied we labeled this protein with a green fluorescent protein and when we saw under the microscope we found that it is going around the nucleus okay. so what we saw that what is happening in the nucleus this protein wants to prevent okay and okay. this is a dna virus uh -huh. and it replicates in the nucleus uh -huh. Uh -huh. so while doing so uh, the plant defense mechanism is very active uh -huh. in the purpose of the plant is to uh, to stop that replication but the anti uh, defense system of the virus is that this protein is preventing certain proteins from the cytoplasm which can go to the nucleus oh okay so the virus is inside and multiplying see uh, cytoplasm produces a reaction material which should go inside the nucleus and kill the virus but that's not happening because the virus is actually protecting itself by uh, uncovering the uh, nucleus right that's right so it is sitting inside causally Yes. and happily uh, robbing the cell plant cell that's very, that's very, the, okay yeah. okay that's what you found when you are looking through a confocal microscope if we if we i can say in more precise terms there is a methylation process in the dna okay this is epigenetic modification takes place in the nucleus so whenever there is any invasions of this kind uh, there is a tendency of the host plant to make those dna methylated okay. so that they cannot replicate uh -huh. but virus don't want this that is why this viral protein which is a nasty protein binding with some protein and this going across the nuclear membrane so that the this protein won't enter into the nucleus and prevents methylation so very very interesting i mean uh, you found the mechanism by which the virus is uh, able to sustain itself i mean by preventing the uh, host defense system weakening the host defense system once you found this mechanism obviously one would say that how do we tackle it what did you do with it so if we can silence this protein uh, as we know by central dogma dna gives rna and rna gives protein so if you can silence it at the rna level so that the protein is not formed ah, ah. so if somehow you can kill that rna in a uh, whenever there is an infection and this plants 
get, getting a viral DNA which is converted to RNA. At RNA level, if you can silence it, then we can escape this uh, infection process. Okay. So that is what we did in tomato. So we developed a transgenic tomato where we incorporated the antisense part of it. The, the RNA which is coding for this protein, a small protein called AC4. So with this protein we silenced by using a mechanism of RNA interference. Okay. So as the name indicates, it is an interference at the RNA level. So you can produce a small interfering RNAs which go and binds to the RNA of this AC4 protein and the protein is not formed. Mm. So by this mechanism, whatever tomato we developed, and when we challenge inoculated with the virus, whenever virus goes and AC4 RNA is formed, this is chopped off by the small interfering RNA already sitting in the so tomato So basically plant. the virus is not able to pro give that kind of a protective uh, coat around the nucleus and then uh, the plant's mechanism takes over, right? So that that's is what, right. uh, that's, that's what right. exactly That's happened. what we did. So this is uh, one work that you did with uh, tomato. Uh, I believe you had a shock of your life when one of your students was working with papaya, right? We want to hear that story. It's an interesting story in papaya. Uh, one of my students, uh, Satendra, he was working with, for his PhD with me and his crop was papaya and he was working one papaya ring spot virus. So papaya ring spot virus, as the name indicates, there are ring spot symptoms on the leaf. So he used to inoculate papaya plants, keep it in the tissue culture room and in the net house and where he's maintaining this virus. So once he was maintaining that virus and he wanted to show me a very good uh, ring spot symptoms on the papaya leaves. So he keep reminding me that the plants are doing very good in the net house and we will go there and see and click some pictures. Next week when I visited the net house and he wanted to show me those papaya plants, and that was a surprise. There were no symptoms on those papaya plant. So then we again tested the leaves, whether the virus is present or not. He did several tests, virus was there, but symptoms were not there. So that was really changed our way of thinking. What happened within one week that symptoms have gone? So we analyzed several things, several parameters we thought. Then we thought maybe first we will go and see the temperature profile. So we noticed that within one week, there is a change of temperature of five to seven degree. So that came to our mind that may be one of the reason. So for that purpose, we now designed a very good experiment to keep papaya plant at different temperatures and inoculate the virus and just see whether there is change in symptoms or not. Then we realized that there is one viral protein which binds with the small RNA, which we called as micro RNA, which is present in the host and controls those micro RNA in such a way that it hijacks the cell machinery. So at higher temperature, that binding is very less. Okay. okay. So when we did a, a controlled experiment, we found that that viral protein binds with small RNA in a dose dependent manner and which is also influenced by the temperature. Very, very interesting. So very at interesting. higher temperature when it is not able to bind with micro RNA and not able to change the gene expression of the plant, the symptoms are not there. We were uh, talking about the possibility or rather the threat of climate change and the global temperature may rise or is expected to rise and it will be a major stress on the plants, right? So. What's your take on it and how are you working toward that? Yeah, it's an important area nowadays. Why? Because le let, let me take an example of wheat crop. So wheat crop uh, maturity time is March and or April first week. So what happens during that time there is a grain filling stage uh, when the grain is filled and then ripening and maturity. During this time... So the grain filling is basically the grain is actually growing and becoming the real uh, dana which we actually consume, right? So that's, that's what right. we are saying. And we, we consume wheat, mostly it is rich in carbohydrates or yeah, starch. Yeah. So that is the stage when the starch is filled up. So it's several uh, biochem... As I said, there are several chemical reactions going on. Several reactions are going on which synthesize the starch during that process. Okay. And this is controlled by various enzymes. And during that time, the, that crop needs a particular temperature. Okay. As you know that we have Ravi crops and Kharif crops, they grow in particular temperatures. But now as the climate is changing and you see sometimes there is a heat 
uh, the temperature shoots up at the March end or April mid, up to April mid. And that is really very dangerous for the wheat crop in the sense that we are reducing yield that time. Mm -hmm. Because that process is affected due to high temperature, certain enzymes which are working to go for the starch filling in the grains gets affected. So that is one challenging area we took. And same times, whenever there is an energy need, there is a photosynthesis going on in all the time. But during that time, we feel that the Rubisco enzyme, which is a key enzyme which controls photosynthesis, is a very, very temperature sensitive enzyme. So there are certain chaperon proteins like Rubisco activase. That activase protein controls Rubisco in some of the elite cultivars or in some of the mutants we are developing. So that type of uh, mutants are resistant to heat and the effect on the star synthesis is relatively less. So that is an interesting area. We are exploring different enzymes okay, which so are which heat sensitive. Okay, so which means that uh, kind of a heat proof uh, uh, maybe a wheat variety might be perhaps a possibility in near future out of your research. That's what. That's uh, right. Still there are certain good varieties which can sustain temperatures up to 40. Okay, okay. That's a that's an interesting point. Let's now shift to your uh, new area of research, which is uh, looking at uh, ensuring the food that we eat is not only filling, but also nutritious. So one of the area that you have been looking at is pearl millet, right? So what is the major challenge in pearl millet? Why it is not necessary? I mean, why? what are the challenges for it to become a ubiquitous uh, grain? Okay. Very, very good point. Why I am saying it is a good point? Because at the moment, our diet is based only on wheat and rice. Yeah. It's not our diet. Globally, this is that's a pattern. It, it. And now it is high time we can think of any of the um, crops which can supplement these two crops. So millets are one of the options. And uh, Government of India has taken it as a big initiative and they are called as Nutri-Cereals. Okay. And there are several millets under the Nutri-Cereals. Pearl millet is one of it. If you see the nutrition of pearl millet, it is very rich in many things and it is rich in iron and zinc. So there are several micronutrients which is present in this crop. But uh, although it is rich in nutrition, but at the same time, if you see, you must have seen in the villages or even in the urban area, you have to go for uh, this pearl millet floor and you always ask for the fresh floor because you cannot keep it for a longer time. So the, long, the shelf life of the pearl millet Why, why floor, pearl millet shelf life is too low compared to, for example, rice or wheat? Good question. So pearl millet, uh, unlike wheat and rice, there is 5 to 6 percent lipids or we can say fat present in this okay. millet. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So once you grind it and make a floor, these lipids are present. Although they are of very good quality, polyunsaturated fatty acid, they are rich in PUFA. They are good for our lipid consumption point of view, but at the same time, they get oxidized ah, and become, become rancid. Okay. okay. So that is why the shelf life of pearl millet floor is very low. So, so once you know that uh, shelf life is low, so what are you working on? Yes, if we want to make pearl millet popular, we have to develop certain varieties where we can have shelf life more than three months or four months so that it can be used in processed food. As you have seen, multigrain atta, multigrain flour is available in market, but it is lacking pearl millet. They are not adding pearl millet because it is spoiling the flour. So we wish that pearl millet flour should be the component of these kind of preparation. For that purpose, one option is to remove lipid, which is not a very good idea because it is rich in PUFA. Yeah, okay. So it is not a good idea to remove lipids. But at the same time, these lipids are oxidized by certain enzymes. So if we cut down on those enzymes, we can denature those enzymes so that lipid gets, won't get oxidized or we add certain antioxidant, we can improve the shelf life. So this, this is the important area. One strong group uh, in the division is working on it. Very, very interesting. And I also saw in your lab, I mean, uh, you are working on uh, black rice. Rice, people will think that I need a rice which is as white as a pearl. But uh, black rice, why do you think it's important? Why are you working on that kind of uh, grains, which are not, let's say, popular in the public? Yes. Uh, I want to tell you why we are working on an unconventional rice, you yeah, can yeah, say. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, it is a pigmented rice. 
And if you see these pigmented rice are basically known earlier as medicinal rice. Mm -hmm. So they have certain properties which are good uh, to eat, not as a regular, uh, as a rice diet, but uh, because of the different type of stresses, we say there are different lifestyle diseases. And you must be hearing about uh, type 2 diabetes, which is very, very common in nowadays. So under those conditions, if you see that some of the pigmented rice, which are rich in anthocyanins, and anthocyanin is a group of pigmented uh, uh, material, which is uh, very good antioxidants. Okay. So whenever we are in stress, there is a tendency that free radicals are formed and they are dangerous for any organs as well as the membranes of the cell. So if something, something can quench those free radicals, mm -hmm. so anthocyanin is one of them. And when we characterize the black rice anthocyanin, they are really, really very good quality. Okay. Uh -huh. And we did certain uh, feeding assays in mouse with the help of one of the laboratory, CSIR laboratory. Okay. And we found that the, uh, during diabetes, what happens and that the pancreatic cells are under pressure because they have to produce more, 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 more. more insulin. So during that time, there is some lesions formed in pancreatic cell. If you, the diet is rich in anthocyanins, that pancreatic cells are easing down. Okay. So that uh -huh. is a process. We cannot say that we can revert type 2 diabetes, but at, at least, least it management, is, management can be done by including anthocyanin in your diet. So this is a kind of focus for your uh, new work, right? So what is this project called as? This is called, we can call as nutritional enhancement or nutritional sustainability. So there, you must have heard about fortification as one of the process by which we can take bioactives from natural sources and supplement it into the food in day to day food. Yeah. Uh, so that there are several examples of fortification. Like for example, one of the most common is iodine fortification of salt. That's right. That's right. And you must have seen that in most of the time we are getting oil from the supermarkets. There is labeling that it is uh, fortified by vitamin E. Yeah. Uh -huh. The purpose of fortification of vitamin E is to reduce the oxidation. As I told, lipids are prone to oxidation. They want, vitamin E is also an antioxidant. So whatever antioxidant they are adding at the moment is of synthetic nature. Yeah. Mm. And if a little bit of chemistry, they, once you synthesize any bioactive molecule into the laboratory, you are making a racemic mixture. When you produce synthetically, 50% is right hand and 50% is left hand and when you consume it, only one of it is actually Absolutely. utilized by our body. Yeah. What happens to the other, we don't know. We don't right? know. Yeah. We don't so know. with this, what you are planning actually? So we want to come up with the extraction of vitamin E from natural sources. Okay. okay. And that too in a cost effective manner. Uh -huh. Because if it is going to be costly, then it is not very much favorable for fortification. Yeah. yeah. So health wise, they have benefit their bioavailability, their bioefficacy is more. And at the same time, when we have to look for, towards the increasing farmer's income, we say it is a good point of secondary agriculture. Okay. So, okay. if so, so basically you are cultivating certain plants so that you can extract uh, some of these vitamins. What are the major vitamins that you are working on? We are working on basically two types of protein. One is vitamin E, okay. which is very much prominent in soybean. Uh -huh. So in soybean and almonds, there are several nuts yeah, okay. and um, almond being ex expensive, but soybean is not that expensive. So we are extracting vitamin E from soybean. Okay. And then we, we are looking forward to take uh, this technology forward in the sense that uh, this can be used for fortification purposes in oil. Okay, very nice. What are the other uh, vitamins that you are working? Another is vitamin A. So these are carotenoids. So this, we all know that uh, if you eat more carrot, you, your eyes will be good. So likewise, uh, how much carrot we can eat? Yeah. It's in a particular season and that too in a particular limited amount we are eating carrots. So if our food, day-to-day day -day food like your milk, processed milk or a curd or anything which you are eating daily, if it is having supplementation from the carrot. Okay then daily you are taking some amount of natural vitamin A. Yeah. So that is the another aspect uh, which we had initiated so that we can extract vitamin A from carrots. Hmm. Very, very, very nice. That's a very, very interesting conversation that we had with you and uh, the kind of range of areas that you are working and your laboratory is working and your institute is contributing to this uh, nation's march for 21st century. We'll uh, have to end this conversation here for want of time. 
Keep watching Vireka. We'll come back with another interesting conversation next week, same time.